to everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, this evening uh, for Diversity in Motion. I'm thrilled to welcome all of you to our first panel discussion on diversity and inclusion. So I'm Kushani, Director of Marketing at Cisco Labs, uh, and I will be moderating um, today's discussion. So as you know, uh, we, have, we recently um, commenced our diversity and inclusion journey at Cisco Labs, and we thought of kicking things off officially with a panel discussion focusing on diversity and inclusion in Sri Lanka and the challenges diverse groups and individuals face on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, just to give you a little context before we dive into the discussion. Uh, so everyone comes from diverse backgrounds with their own collection of experiences. Diversity is not simply defined by ethnicities, races, nationalities, and cultures. It is uh, much more uh, than that. It encompasses language, religion, disabilities, gender, age, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, ideologies, and much more. So in today's discussion, however, we will focus on four key areas we feel are important for us as Sri Lankans. Uh, they, are, uh, they are ethnicity and religion, females at work, persons with disability and sexual orientation and gender uh, identities. So in the next uh, 45 minutes, we will explore the uh, deep-rooted impact diversity and inclusion issues have in our communities, how it impacts our everyday interactions, and how corporates can be a catalyst for change to create a more inclusive environment for everyone uh, to be who they are. So I hope by the end of this uh, session, you will be inspired to go on your own learning journey and build deeper empathy for the, uh, for the people around you. So uh, let's get uh, started. Today we have, uh, we have invited three panelists who are experts in their respective fields to lead this uh, discussion. Um, Bani Chandrasena, Vice President Diversity Collective Lanka. Bani, if you can say hi. <laughs> yeah, so Div Diversity Collective Lanka is a forum uh, committed to uh, making Sri Lanka a key uh, global hub of human uh, resources, offering optimal gender diversity in the, uh, in the local IT and services uh, industries. And then we have Janita Rukmar. Janita? Yeah, he's co-founder at Enable Lanka. Enable Lanka Foundation works to dignify and reframe the value of uh, persons with disabilities uh, in society. Uh, then we have uh, Rosanna, Rosanna Flema Caldera. Rosanna, hi. Uh, Executive Director and Foundation at uh, Equal Ground. Equal, Equal Ground is a nonprofit organization seeking economic, social, cultural, civil, and political rights for the LGBT IQ plus community of Sri Lanka. They're committed to uh, creating a safe uh, space for all LGBT IQ plus individuals. Then we have Prashant Devaisa. Hi, Prashant, uh, president and founder of Sri Lanka Unites and Global Unites. Uh, it is a group uh, with individuals from all ethnicities and religions working together to provide hope and facilitate reconciliation in Sri Lanka, paving the way for a peaceful and prosperous country for future generations. Uh, so in the first round, uh, we will focus on issues related to uh, diversity and inclusion and their impact uh, on everyday interaction. So each uh, speaker will have five minutes uh, to answer and in total this session will be uh, 20 minutes. Uh, right, uh, so my first question uh, is to Prashant. Uh, Prashant, I would like for you to open this discussion by explaining to us about some of the ethnicity and religion related uh, social inclusion issues Sri Lanka is facing uh, at present. Thank you. Uh, thank you to uh, Cisco Labs for the invitation and for the opportunity to speak. I'm honored to be on this uh, conversation with a very distinguished panel of people who are doing meaningful work uh, to ensure that Sri Lanka is a diverse and a united country benefiting from our diversity and not shying away from it. Uh, you know, sometimes I, I once heard a student after one of our events come to me and say, Prashana, I, I think what you're trying to tell me is, is diversity is our superpower. 
uh, it's not our kryptonite. Uh, you know, we are we are stronger when we are together. And in fact, this this beauty uh, that we have in all these diverse elements of our society uh, gives us greater perspective, gives us greater strength, and gives us the ability to reach out to a broader spectrum of society and the globe. Because Sri Lanka is blessed of having, you know, four of the greatest religions in the world living side by side here in this country. Four incredibly rich cultures, languages. And so we have, from a very young age, we were not, you know, trapped into a monolingual, monoethnic, monoreligious society. We have been refined by these things. We, our lives have become colorful. Our lives have been made empowered by this. And so it's a matter of now embracing it. And, you know, you can dig for all the oil you want or the gas you want, but if you can dig deeper into the beauty of your diversity, I think there is a far greater, more valuable resource in our nation that we haven't tapped to. And, and we have, unfortunately, without tapping into what would be our greatest resource, we have gone ahead and found reasons to divide, find, found reasons to be mistrusting of one another, reasons to embrace prejudice against each other, and as a result, we have hurt our own potential as a country. And so I really believe that at least as the next generation and those in corporate Sri Lanka right now, that if all of us can play an active role to ensure, number one, we embrace and understand the value and the richness of our diversity, and number two, that we work hard to counter any renewed efforts to divide us. Because from the colonial era all the way to now, those who have tried to govern Sri Lanka have used this evil pattern of divide and rule. They'll divide you along your ethnicity, your religion, your gender, your sexual orientation, or your ability or disability, or whatever it is, and then they will try to create a, a prejudice. They'll try to create animosity. They'll try to create mistrust. And as a result of that, you're easy to govern. You're easy to be controlled. And that's what the colonials did, colonizers did, and that's what our politicians have done over the years. What could have been our greatest strength has been used as our greatest weapon to destroy this country. So if that's the case, then why is it important that we embrace, uh, why, why is it important that we take steps, is when we look at our country's history, in, in 72 years of independence, we have lost half a million people due to senseless violence. Half a million people in less than a century of independence have died untimely deaths because we couldn't learn to live with each other because we couldn't learn to embrace the richness of our diversity. Over 3 million Sri Lankans have left our country. Uh, they've left for economic reasons, they left for reasons of the instability of the country, of the fact that this was not an inclusive place. They left, and now they're contributing to other GDPs and other countries when they could have been contributing to us. And at the same time, almost every 15 to 18 years, we've had cycles of violence. No one can deny that. You could go through it almost, it's almost like clockwork. We've had reasons to come and fight with one another. Every time Sri Lanka takes five steps forward, we've taken 10 steps back because of our inability to deal with it. So that's why it's an important conversation in the workplace, in the school, in our villages, in our communities, in our nation, and even in our parliaments and policy. Because every strata of our society need to address this. You know, uh, for those of you who know the Alcohol is uh, Anonymous program, where when they meet, everybody sits around in a circle and everybody says, my name is so-and-so, and I am an alcoholic. You have to first acknowledge that you have a problem. That's the first step to recover from a problem. And so we as Sri Lankans, because it is who we are, but we have a problem. We haven't been able to embrace our diversity. We haven't been able to intelligently discuss our issues and non-violently solve it. And so this is not just a, a nice thing to include in our corporate structure. This is vital for us in Sri Lanka. You know, if you have a history, a family history of, well, you guys are diabetic or you have heart disease or you have some sort of family history, then from a very young age, your family starts saying, listen, we have sugar in our family or we have, you know, cholesterol in our family. You have to take the precautions because this could happen to you because it's in our DNA. And similarly, we have a history of violence. We have a history of not being able to address this issue of diversity well. So when you know that, this is not just a fancy thing that corporates stick on to. For us, as Sri Lanka, this is vital. We have to address this, and every Sri Lanka needs to be part of it. So that's why I feel it's important, and I'm so glad to be part of this conversation. Thank you.
All right. Thanks for the detailed explanation, Krishan. I think uh, it was very insightful uh, answer. Um, so, Bani, uh, so I will now move on to uh, females at work. Uh, Bani, in terms of stats, can you share with us details of social inclusion issues uh, females in Sri Lanka face? Um, so, if you talk about stats, um, okay, so let me start with um, contribution and employment. Uh, if you look at um, women contributing and um, in employment, it's at about 32%. Um, I think that number on its own is a little scary when you think of our population being 50-50, but I think what makes it even more um, you know, something to take note of is when you think of some of the rest of the Asian countries and women contributing, uh, if you think of countries like Vietnam, Thailand, they are in the 60 and the 70 percent. Um, and Sri Lanka in comparison, not only Sri Lanka, but a lot of Southeast Asian countries are struggling in the 25, 30, 30 range. So I think there is a cultural element to it. Um, which is something I think we'll be talking about a little bit more so I can dive into the solutions there. Um, but I think another thing to consider um, is also um, the tech industry, since we are, um, since you guys are in the tech industry. Um, one of the things that I've kind of explored and researched a little bit is um, why the 32%? Is it uh, women or girls not joining? Uh, the STEM education stream, computer science. Um, what the numbers actually show is, yes, we do have women uh, or girls dropping out in STEM. Um, but if you look at the university level, they are at the computer science, it's about 40%. Um, but when you look at companies, it's about 32%, like I said. Um, the reason for the dropout um, is element of cultural and also sometimes um, it is, I think, the way STEM and um, IT, etc., all these sciences are actually taught. Um, it tends to be uh, not customized enough or relating to the fact that boys and girls think very differently. Um, realizing that how you actually customize that teaching and making maths and science not so difficult or um, logical might be one of the things that we need to consider. Um, so there is a lot of things um, from how our communities have evolved our traditions to, um, you know, how we behave as well as in. So I think uh, let me talk a little bit about why it really does matter. Why should companies actually care about this? Um, all companies care about money. Let's go to the business case. Um, we don't have stats in Sri Lanka. These are more global stats, but um, definitely I, I'm going to actually read it out so that I don't get it mixed up. But there are a couple of stats that I think are really worthwhile. Um, and I'll give you some comparisons uh, for Sri Lanka as well in comparison to that. So if you look at, if you take like for like companies um, with at least one woman on the board would have outperformed stocks with no women on the board by 26%. To me, that's a really big number. Um, in other words, having that here, they're only referring to gender diversity, but the next step I'm going to talk about is more than just gender. So it is basically saying having that diversity makes a huge difference in how decisions are made and how you uh, review situations, problems, and it's something to really take note. Another stat which the Financial Times talked about is for every 1% rise in the rate of gender diversity, there is a um, rise in 3% sales revenue. Similarly, if there's a 1% rise in ethnic diversity, there's a 9% rise in sales revenue. Now, what this is basically saying is you do have you have to bring in all the consumers when you are making business decisions. How do you ensure all the consumers and customers are involved when you make those decisions? Is by making sure that you have that diversity in your company. 
diversity uh, is one part of it. Inclusion is the other, which we're going to talk more about. But having that differences, celebrating, not just tolerating, becomes really important in actually trying to get to these outcomes that I referred to here. Um, so it is a little bit complex and it is not straightforward purely because it is nuanced. It is mindset change that we're talking about here, but uh, it actually starts with programs like this that you all are doing um, at Cisco Labs, which is great, but it can't stop at just a conversation. It can't just stop at awareness. It then needs to be held accountable. Um, the company needs to hold themselves accountable. The um, individuals have to be held accountable if you really want these habits to change. Uh, like Prashant mentioned, um, there is a history and today the world is different, but we seem to have gotten very slow at changing with some of the conveniences, especially when it comes to gender. Um, I know every one of the different uh, minority groups have uh, different issues, but um, it's a little sad that we consider women a minority group when it comes to, uh, you know, community and the workplace when we are very much uh, involved in everything else. And when you think of family units, all of that kind of stuff. So I uh, thank you for bringing this question up uh, and I hope to be able to maybe talk a little bit more about what are some of the things we can do as individuals, we can do as companies to try and um, correct this um, disparity that we have. Hopefully that helps yeah. as a start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, Mani, uh, for sharing those chats uh, and and especially for spotlighting the the need to hold each other accountable to diversity in everything we do for uh, much richer outcomes. Uh, all right. So my next question is to Janita. Uh, Janita, in terms of uh, social progression, uh, what are the challenges faced by persons uh, with disability? Uh, yeah, thank you so much for this question. Uh, and I really appreciate that uh, persons with disabilities being represented in forums like this, particularly um, related to um, sort of employment and workplace related inclusion. So um, I would like to first simplify this term uh, social progress and uh, that, that actually means whenever uh, due to various conditions, we find various barriers in moving up in the society. So when it comes to persons living with disabilities, um, we do this, uh, I would like to take my approach uh, with this uh, amazing activity some of us have been doing uh, in uh, workshops, trainings. We do this power walk. So in power walks, uh, we give different people different roles and um, based on various scenarios, we observe or reflect on the kind of leverage each of these social roles have. So when we do that, I have realized when people have been given the role of a person with a disability. We, I mean, sometimes we give gender specific roles such as woman with a disability or a, like that. So when they are given such roles, and at the end of the power walk, when we see and reflect where they are standing in the line, we see them far behind everyone else. So that means the kind of social progression that we perceive that is available for a person with a disability, uh, sometimes being sensitive to gender as well, is so low that reflects or that rather shows where we have positioned uh, disability in defining a person's status in the society. So when we move up the ladder, the main challenges we encounter are starting from this very society itself, where there is an unyielding stigma. Uh, this stigma, unfortunately, is very cultural. In some countries, you already have seen people, for example, people like um, Stevie Wonder, or people like uh, Hopkins, or even uh, these inspirational speakers like Nick Yuchik. 
So all these people have moved forward in the society regardless of the kind of disabilities they have in their respective field. But in Sri Lanka, unfortunately, although we have one, uh, we have had 1.7 million persons with disabilities included in the census 10 years ago, which is not reflecting the actual number of persons with disabilities because people tend to hide the families now there will be over 2 million persons out of 20 million uh, or 22 million people so that is close to 10 percent or 8 percent so in that sense uh, persons with disabilities regardless of their numbers they are invisible in the society so that what does that say that says as a society the sort of opportunities that that should be given to the persons with disabilities which have been taken away from them uh, so as i mentioned earlier the persons with disabilities are often kept hidden in their um, house or some people might call them kind of dungeons because uh, because it, it is the kind of norm that has been there but now uh, fortunately, parents have started realizing the value of providing education and uh, social inclusion of their children with disabilities, and now things are changing for the better. However, uh, that that uh, stigma is the first barrier, and second barrier is the lack of infrastructure to accommodate persons with disabilities in meaningful ways in the society. We see persons with disabilities being invited to various forums, various uh, events, which is rather tokenistic. Because honestly, do we really um, sort of think of them as people who have just as much potential as anyone of us would have? And uh, so that is something where we see a lot of skepticism in the society a lot of people when they are asked uh, okay i have this uh, super amazing person known to me who's uh, uh, good with this particular field but he's living with a disability they say uh, living with a disability or can they really do that so that is the kind of skepticism we see pervade in the society so that is the first issue and 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 also the infrastructure and then even when they are confidence level rises and they say okay we can open up the opportunity for these people so starting from the accessibility in the workplace and then the kind of attitudes of co-workers the kind of environment that is there for a person to work and even when it comes to the modern world we have software and ict infrastructure whether it is conducive for a person's disability to work with and all that is taken into consideration and also the processes in uh, in the in the workplace uh, starting from uh, marking your attendance at work all the way to uh, applying leave getting your salary everything there are barriers so when we consider um, as uh, overall two issues one issue is as i mentioned the stigma and the second one is the lack of infrastructure to facilitate accessibility for persons with disabilities to society, public places, and opportunities. So I think we can talk more in the next sessions. Yes, uh, thanks, Janita, for shedding light on this area. I think as individuals and corporates, I think we really need to action how we can remove barriers for persons with disabilities to be equal and participatory members of our society so that they will be able to contribute to our economy and have a productive and quality life. All right. Uh, uh, my next question is uh, is addressed to uh, Rosanna on the LGBT IQ plus community. Uh, uh, Rosanna, being an advocate for change for the LGBT IQ plus community, can you explain to us the issues faced by this community in Sri Lanka? 
great. Thank you so much uh, again for having me on this panel and uh, kudos to my fellow panelists. Uh, they have echoed so much of the uh, you know issues facing uh, various segments of uh, you know uh, individuals who are basically uh, marginalized because of who they are and what they are. Um, and so uh, a long time ago, <laughs> uh, almost 20 years ago when I started my activism in Sri Lanka uh, for the, you know, fighting for the rights of the LGBTIQ uh, plus community, um, it was very apparent that uh, most of the issues stemmed on archaic mindsets on who we actually were. So, of course, the, the two laws that the British, uh, you know, put in place uh, before they, they took off from Sri Lanka has created a lot of uh, issue for the LGBTIQ community and has far wider implications than the actual law itself. So in Sri Lanka, for example, it's a criminal offense uh, for a person to have sexual relations uh, consenting sexual relations with somebody of the same sex. Um, and this is something that the British uh, basically uh, put in place uh, in 1883. In 1995, that law was amended. Uh, the word male was dropped. So it was originally a sodomy law uh, that the British imparted to all of the, the countries of the Commonwealth, all the countries that they had under their empire. Um, and so we got stuck with that. But by dropping the word male, um, it meant that it opened it out to everybody. And when I say everybody, even the heterosexual community. But we know for a fact that heterosexual community is not harassed, marginalized, or discriminated and shunned uh, using this law. It is mainly used to harass and discriminate against the LGBTIQ community. Having said that, when we first started Equal Ground, we realized that there was a lot of um, ignorance about this community, who we are, uh, and what we are, and what we are capable of doing. So our strategic plan actually looked at not only educating and sensitizing the public, but also educating and sensitizing our own LGBTIQ community. Because years and years of marginalization and discrimination, you know, it does something to your psyche. You are so scared. Uh, you're constantly looking over your shoulder. You are constantly thinking that they're not going to like me because I'm the way that I am. How do I tell Ami and Tati I'm like this? Uh, they are not going to like that and so on and so forth. So the uh, stigma and internalized homophobia is so um, huge that a lot of people try to mask that by pretending to be heterosexual and trying to be blending in into the heterosexual population of this country just to be able to get along. So our second strategic plan was to basically uh, sensitize and educate our own LGBTIQ community uh, to be out, to be proud and to accept who they are and what they are. It's very difficult, I'm telling you, growing up as a lesbian um, it was something that I struggled with for a very, very long time. And it took me to go to the United States for 15 years to come out and accept myself for who I am. Yeah. Um, so I can just imagine in this country where there is such a lot of conservative rhetoric and, um, you know, uh, issues regarding anything that's different, as even uh, Janitha said um, and, and the others have said. Um, it, it was a, a difficult thing, but that's like beyond me now. So the only thing that I could give back uh, to my country and, and to my fellow LGBTIQ persons um, was to start an organization that was needing to show people that we are just ordinary folk like everybody else, maybe sometimes a little bit more sort of flamboyant at times or, you know, uh, very, very creative. Uh, but nevertheless, we are people who also need to, to work, to go to school, to, to have lives uh, that shouldn't be marginalized and pushed aside because of who we love and who we want to be. So in um, last year, we uh, actually uh, two years ago, we started a mapping study to find out what exactly, um, you know, was uh, 
the situation with the LGBTIQ community in, in Sri Lanka. So this also revealed, you know, that uh, some information that uh, most people actually don't even know. Uh, first and foremost, 12.2% of the population, well, of those uh, interviewed for the mapping study, uh, identified as LGBTIQ. So uh, that's 12% of the adult population. Um, it also revealed that 11% of LGBTIQ respondents have faced some form of abuse and discrimination due to their sexual orientation or gender identity. 6% of the LGBTIQ respondents mentioned that they were refused medical treatment. 10% uh, they have uh, said that they have been refused employment. And a further 12% have been forced out of work or education or out of their houses. 10% uh, of the LGBTIQ respondents have faced physical assault. And 17% of them have faced some type of harassment, including verbal abuse, harassment by the police, family, uh, work, and so on. Um, it also, the evidence also shows that uh, LGBTIQ persons face more bullying and harassment during childhood, which leads to interruptions in education and, and, and you know, basically a lot more mental health issues uh, than necessary, uh, having to go through all of that as a child. Um, we also did a, a, a small research uh, on uh, workplace um, and uh, how LGBTIQ persons are perceived in the workplace and what they go through in the workplace. Um, it's interesting to note that most people don't even reveal that their sexuality at work because they're too scared that they're going to get fired or that they're going to get harassed uh, and not you know, promoted for you know, a job well done or whatever. But basically, 58% of them stated that they have experienced verbal harassment. 31% said many of them struggle uh, uh, um, and, and have faced sexual harassment as well. In the workplace, this is, right? 44% um, said they were not willing to report such harassment uh, to the management because they fear facing more reprisals. Tragically, 23% of the respondents, uh, respondents also mentioned leaving their jobs due to psychological and emotional harassment. So it is unacceptable, really, that in the 21st century, in this day and age, that we have to go through a situation where our livelihoods are compromised, the uh, economic security of our LGBTIQ individuals is compromised. So, and the irony of it all is that, you know, we have a lot of bright, amazing, creative, very, very uh, intelligent individuals who can basically contribute a lot to the growth of this country. Um, but as Prasant said, um, a lot of them seek uh, employment outside of the country and have been doing it for years. A lot of them have sought asylum in different countries because of the situation that they're facing in Sri Lanka. So we are really losing a lot of very, very talented and amazing individuals just because uh, the government refuses to acknowledge um, and include the LGBTIQ community. Uh, it's high time, I think, that they change the laws. But one good thing that we can do um, in lieu of the government not supporting us is to make sure that corporate Sri Lanka follows diversity, equality, equity, and um, inclusion policies within the workplace. This is one way, as a private sector, we can start acknowledging, um, you know, the, the the potential of the LGBTIQ community and including them in 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 our workplace, so that they can be economically, um, you know, uh, supported as well as contribute uh, a lot to uh, this country in so many different ways. So diversity and inclusion programs. Um, our start. Um, we started this uh, diversity and inclusion programs at Equal Ground uh, probably six years ago. Um, we worked with John Keels Holdings and we uh, managed to get them to change their human resources policies to include LGBTIQ persons. 
uh, we sensitized and educated over 8,000 of their employees within their group. Um, and uh, this sort of like started to slowly um, snowball. Uh, we have, now we, we are up to almost 40 companies that we have, um, you know, uh, done our diversity and inclusion uh, programs with. So we're really, really happy when Cisco Labs gave us a call and said, hey, let's do this. Yeah. Um, I think knowledge is the key. Uh, knowledge and education is the key uh, to make a lot of changes in this country. Um, it's really so sad that we've had so many years uh, post-independence um, and we've just squandered uh, what we had, you know, uh, we have squandered uh, a lot of the stuff that I, I remember a long time ago, half of you were not born, but uh, Lee Kuan Yew was playing golf with Dudley Senanayaka and uh, he said, uh, Prime Minister, I want Singapore to be exactly like Sri Lanka. And Singapore went on to be an amazing and still is an amazing country. And we went completely into the toilet somewhere. So, you know, we need to be able to realize uh, the potential of our people, as Prashant said, you know, and not leave anyone behind. So I'm going to end there and we can talk more later. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Rosanna. We hope Sri Lanka will follow the example set by Singapore or maybe India and demonstrate uh, broad national support for this community and promptly uh, repeal the law. We will now move on uh, to the second round. So in this round, we will explore the ways in which corporates can get involved and the role they can play as employers. Uh, so for this, we have four minutes per speaker. Um, my first question is to uh, Prashant. Uh, can one say that these are uh, social issues, dynamics outside the workplace, and uh, therefore not a matter for corporates to be addressing? Um, for me, the answer is pretty obvious. Obviously, we can't, and that's why you're having this. But the thing is, sometimes it's like, oh, that sounds like a political issue, or that sounds like something that uh, it's, it should be discussed in parliament. Uh, but, but maybe not in the workplace, maybe it will complicate situations and so on. And that kind of thinking is extremely dangerous. And uh, we have to know that all of us as Sri Lankans, we have a responsibility to ensure we don't make the same mistakes of the past. I think it was Albert Einstein who once said that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different outcome. Uh, and so in that case, we are doing the same thing over and over again. We're not learning a lesson from our past. So we must be clinically insane. Uh, so any country that has gone to achieve something great has learned from their mistakes, looked at history. And so once one man once said, you know, people, if there's something we have learned from history is that we don't learn from history. Uh, and unfortunately, we, we allow these patterns to happen. So if we have learned from history, then it's important that you and I speak up in the workplace as well. If we feel that somebody is discriminated based on any of these reasons, their religion, their ethnicity, their gender, their sexual orientation or whatever, disability, that we are not people who are going to be silently endorsing it. Your silence is one of the most compelling endorsements of evil. And so we have to speak against that. We have to change the culture in the workplace. And sometimes uh, we may say, no, we are more refined in our workplace. It doesn't really happen. Everybody's good and all that. And sometimes it's very superficial, but no one feels confident enough to speak about what they're going through. Uh, if that's the case, then that's also an issue where you may not see it outwardly, but no one feels comfortable to share what they're really feeling. I remember doing a session like this to a well-known company. And one of the uh, employees said, you know, I'm a minority, I'm a Tamil. But even my last name, I've changed because I'm afraid. My family has told, don't say that you're Tamil out loud. So I speak Sinhala very well. There are so many Tamils who do that in this country. Who they've changed their names just to fit in. They speak, they went to Sinhala medium just to fit in. And so even in the workplace, they're not sure if they can come and speak. You know, this is my religion or this is my ethnicity. They're worried that they might be treated differently. And even if it doesn't appear that way, they don't think that others will fully understand where they're coming from. So another challenge that why corporate Sri Lanka needs to embrace this, another reason is because uh, in our education system, there are 10,130 schools under the Ministry of Education. I'm sure all of us went to one of these schools. But from these schools, only 115 schools or 113 schools 
have Singhala medium and Tamil medium both taught under the same roof. So an overwhelming majority of schools, after 10,000 schools, only 100 were, were we actually interacting with people from different religions and different ethnicities. And so we don't really have much experience, but in the workplace, especially in the tech industry and more progressive and new, new generation industries, uh, you have more diversity. So use that as an opportunity to really talk about what are some of the differences, what are the similarities, what are the grievances, what are the hurts, what are the pains, what are the fears, what are the aspirations, what are the goals, and that you can be an advocate for each other, that you ensure that in the next generation, Sri Lanka, no one feels like a second class citizen. We did this nationwide survey, especially interviewing young men and women who belong to ethnically and religiously numerically minority groups. 92% of them said, I do feel like a second class Sri Lanka. 92%. They didn't feel like they were a first class Sri Lankan. They felt if I wanted to be first class, then I would have had to be on the majority ethno religious background. If not, I am second class. And even among those who are part of the majority community, those who didn't belong to the capital or didn't belong to, didn't go to a rich school or come from a rich community, they also felt like second class Sri Lankans. So, majority of our people have an issue of not feeling welcomed or included or encouraged, and that might be the case in your workplace as well. So you have to actively find ways to ensure that's not the case. And if you're really good at it at the workplace, you will be an example and a model for the rest of society. Cisco Labs could lead the way for Sri Lanka. You'll show the beauty of the diverse, show greater results than other companies that are not as diverse as you or don't pay much attention to diversity as you. Show that you're more effective because there is power in our diversity. There is power in that. So that's why I feel it's very important. And now another realm that we have is this whole issues of social media. So some people face to face, they're very polite and respectful and may not say offensive things. But on social media, a different animal comes out. All those prejudices comes out. So unintentionally, they're liking things that are very racist and toxic. They're, they're sharing things that are very racist and toxic. They're having personal conversations about a certain religion, a certain ethnicity. And therefore, you may never say it in public, but you're allowing that. Or you see it on social media and you, you're not saying anything, you're not liking it, but you're never standing up against it. And therefore, we are being part of the problem. You would be amazed that we, we are now, Sri Lanka United is one of the trusted partners for Facebook. And we do a lot of the uh, filtering of hate speech and, and you know, very abusive content online. And you would think, oh, most of this content is coming from rural Sri Lanka and these people don't know. The overwhelming majority come from Colombo. Very closely followed by Kandy, Gampaha and Putana. And a lot of these people are not just Colombo in the periphery. This is even from Colombo Center. People are sharing this stuff. They're liking this stuff. They're believing this stuff. So we have a responsibility and a role to play. If we don't find, figure out a way to respond to these challenges, our children are going to inherit the same challenges and the mess that we have. So we have that opportunity to be that generation that fixes this, that embraces our diversity and never allows anybody to be treated differently because of the fact that they're different. Thanks, uh, Kushan. Yeah, for sure, it's important for corporates to understand these issues well and fix them uh, at a corporate level uh, because that space is uh, within our control. And this approach will trickle down to, uh, to society and eventually to the whole of Sri Lanka. Uh, right, so uh, my next question is, is to Janita. Uh, uh, what can corporates do to support uh, persons with disabilities and truly be an equal employer? Can you uh, share some uh, case studies with us? Yes, certainly. Thank you for that question. Uh, so after identifying the issues, uh, what we should do is actually finding the kind of ways we can address these solutions. So uh, talking about the sort of inclusion of persons with disabilities in workplace and in corporate, uh, my first hint would be to consider unlearning some stuff. This is to say that usually when we associate or when we uh, reflect on our own perceptions of disability. Um, we perceive disability in the light of 
um, kind of uh, a condition that requires care and charity. So that is why a lot of corporates have sort of spotlighted um, disability inclusion in their corporate social responsibility, CSR. Yes, at some point, corporates had this responsibility uh, towards persons with disabilities as a minority, as a marginalized community or underrepresented community that needed their support unconditionally regardless of their capacities. But the times have changed and the society has evolved in such a way that now the persons with disabilities are no longer the kind of community which always needs some amount of uh, money for consolation to survive. That is not the case any longer. Now persons with disabilities also have had access to inclusive education and various resources through which they could improve their soft skills and through which they are already improving their soft skills. But of course, there are certain uh, kind of barriers in education which prevents them from achieving the kind of qualifications that re that's required to approach the job market in an equal footing with everyone else. So the corporates should, I believe, be more flexible in their recruitment policies when it comes to persons with disabilities. And that does not mean um, recruiting a person with disability uh, is going to be CSR. They have their own set of skills and they are willing to work for your organization. That is why they are applying for your organization's position. And for them to apply, the organization should create that environment. Being an equal opportunity employer holistically means that there is access to persons with disabilities as well in the company. And also, at the same time, we have to consider once they are recruited, how are they going to perform well in the company? Just like anybody else, a person with disability also will be eager to have promotions, to have kind of their own uh, way up the proverbial ladder. So in that case, uh, if an organization that recruits a person's disability finds them as some kind of a case of charity, uh, what happens is they will be paid monthly, but they will not be adding anything valuable to the progress of the organization. They will be burdening down at some point when there are these golden handshakes and uh, send-offs send in the organization, especially in a context where like COVID-19, the first lot will be the persons with disabilities who have been thus recruited, saying, uh, you know, you don't add much value to our company and plus uh, we are just maintaining you as a charity case. So, uh, sorry, this is the end of the way. But if you create an enabling environment, what happens is persons with disabilities will lead the way. For example, um, I will now go for these case studies. So one instance is a reputed ICT company that recruited one of our friends as, um, as a customer care associate. So uh, they had to figure out some things with regard to the access of their ICT system. And, uh, this friend of ours, uh, who's also joining with us in Enable Lanka Foundation, uh, was very flexible. And uh, he had the kind of English knowledge required for that pr process, profession and, uh, and the kind of soft skills. But the system that was in place in the company uh, was not accessible to the screen reading programs. So usually, when a visually impaired person is recruited by a company, the general consensus is that they will need everything in Braille. But unfortunately, that is not the case. They have access to computers just like anyone else does through screen readers. And re right now, as a person with a disability, I am also using a screen reader. So like that, we have to be able to 
accommodate their needs in consultation with them and then make their inclusion productive and meaningful for the company rather than taking it up as a CSR initiative. I think that's it from me. Thank you. Right. Uh, thanks, Janita, for mentioning some uh, key areas through which uh, corporates can learn and adopt. Uh, so next question is to Rosanna. Um, she's here, right? Okay. Uh, Rosanna, can you share with us some steps corporates in Sri Lanka have taken to lobby for change when it comes to uh, LGBTQ plus rights? Um, That's but, a yeah. Um, so why is it important for, for you know, diversity and inclusion um, to include LGBTIQ within the workplace? Um, I think I will start off with a few stats to, uh, just to you know, uh, get the, the, the ball rolling. Um, and one of the stats comes from the United States, of course, uh, which uh, basically um, since um, legalizing same-sex marriage in the United States, um, gay weddings have boosted the U.S. economy by 3.8 billion U.S. dollars. Um, what uh, the cost of discrimination, for example, in the travel uh, business um, uh, 218 billion US dollars is lost on travel um, by discriminating against the LGBTIQ community. India, for example, uh, the cost of discrimination uh, is 85 billion US dollars. So it's a huge market out there for the LGBTIQ persons um, for buying, for traveling, for uh, you know, shopping and all of that. So there is a big market. So that's one one uh, reason. The second reason, of course, is basically about being human and being uh, accepting of difference and accepting of people of all different um, sexual orientations, gender identities, disabilities, gender, whatever. Um, it's not something that, you know, Sri Lanka can continue to, to, to do because these last two years, especially with COVID, has shown how our economy is floundering. And as a result of, you know, discrimination and, and unfair practices and laws, you are marginalizing or you are excluding 12% of the population from actually participating fully uh, in the growth of this country. So it's really a no brainer, but it seems that, you know, people would much rather prefer to like exclude than to include and go forward as a nation of persons that are, you know, I mean, it, it I, I'm trying to find the words, but sometimes I can't because it, it, it still boggles my mind why uh, Sri Lanka uh, the Sri Lanka that I grew up in, which was so much more um, inclusive and embracing and kind, uh, has become this nation of uh, people hating, yeah, people haters, um, and basically trying to make divisions um, uh, to, to try and disqualify people from being within the circle, you know, so to speak. So I think that. Um, there have been a lot of excuses put forward, uh, particularly in the last four or five years or six years since we've been doing diversity and inclusion programs, where businesses have said to me, oh, you know, um, we'll, we'll lose business if we start accepting these policies and changing our policies. But basically that is so untrue because there is no significant data to uh, say that, you know, businesses are lost because you have... Uh, employed LGBTIQ persons in, in your workplace. Um, the other thing that they have put forward is, oh, it's against the law. So uh, we might get into trouble with the government for um, you know hiring LGBTIQ persons. That also is just something that they have thought of just to make an excuse. Because the law is very specific. The law is specific. I can stand on the street and say, I'm a lesbian. Nobody can arrest me. Nobody can do anything other than harass me, of course. Uh, but legally, there's nothing that can be done. So the excuses need to stop now. Um, and it is crucial as we go forward and try to get out of this whole pandemic situation 
and the economic hole that we have dug ourselves into, that every single person who is eligible to work should be allowed to work and brought into work, regardless of who they are, as long as they can do the job. And the LGBTIQ community most definitely can do the job. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Rosanna, for the insights you gave uh, gave us to create a more inclusive culture so everyone can be who they are. Uh, Barney, can you share with us some examples that made a difference for females in the workplace? Um, so I think it starts with giving everyone a vo voice. Um, and what I mean by that is, okay, some of the things that um, I'm familiar with that I've seen work is um, what we call networks or creating safe spaces for uh, like-minded people, allies to come together and start talking about um, ideas, suggestions when it comes to companies. Um, now, when we talk about networks, there are two sides to this. So there is creating that safe space so that these ideas can come, but you need to make sure these ideas are heard by management and brought into uh, policy change, etc. Um, so that would be giving the majority or the, the employees the voice. Um, but you can't sort of do that in isolation because you don't want people to go into their separate corners also. The whole idea is raising all these points and collectively celebrating, collectively trying to uh, figure out what can be done. Um, while you give them a voice, uh, leadership and what you do with management, I think is really important because that's kind of the role modeling that happens and that's kind of what everybody takes a cue from. Um, so holding everybody accountable to inclusive behavior becomes really important. And I know we all talk about diversity and that basically identifies the differences that we all are. But to me, diversity doesn't mean much unless we change our behaviors towards accepting and celebrating uh, and wanting to work together. So it has to kind of be two prong. Leadership has to be held accountable. Training needs to be given because um, my experience has been people are are afraid sometimes, especially when it comes with uh, people with disability, with women, that you don't want to offend. So you end up playing it safe and not getting them involved. Um, the other side of this that I think is really important, and, and if you really look at stats, um, the 32% in employment that I, that I spoke about, if you look at leadership, uh, especially in the tech space, it drops to about 10 or 11%. Women on boards is only 11%. If you are intentionally looking for change, you do have to create that career path. And that career path is uh, recruitment related, it is training related, it is um, coaching and development, mentoring programs. You intentionally do need to hold yourself accountable when you start these programs to make sure that you are bringing those numbers in. Um, there is this whole... Um, conversation about no we hire people on merit and you know that so so we're not guilty we're not saying don't hire don't do tokenism and hire women for the sake of women but make sure that some of the filtering and the decision making is not biased which kind of makes it a disadvantage um and the um the other thing that i feel is sort of important is um one of the basic things is okay you know, there are women in uh, leadership, so um, the opportunities are there. Uh, why are they not applying for it? Why are they not getting it? You also have to realize um, when you think of a family unit and if it is a, a mother and a father, you do need to make sure that if you're going to give women the opportunity in the workplace, there is a balance in the home front also. Because we just assume, OK, the opportunity is there, the woman gets the uh, role and she still has to do everything that is expected in the house, which is the cultural element, and also go above and beyond in the workplace in order to progress. Um, so I think one of the main things as companies, as communities, we need to address is when we're talking about empowerment, it's not just empowering that group, that minority group. You have to bring the whole population together and make sure that the mindset of what inclusion is, what 
sharing a load is becomes really important. Um, so, for example, uh, what I mean by that is to shift how people think, um, making sure that um, sharing child care, making sure there is paternity leave as much as maternity leave, talking about that, making sure that you recognize the allies or the men who are sharing and supporting because you kind of have to show the right behavior because it's not out there enough for people to try and understand. So for sure, education is the starting point. Having these conversations in classrooms, in schools becomes important. Being able to talk about it in um, family units, all of that becomes part of it. And I, I understand your, this is a, a corporate kind of environment we're talking about here, but we have to push it down to that also because what you're seeing in the workplace is what's happening at home. You do need to then do events that actually get men involved in the conversation. You can't just empower women, give the space, safe space for women and wonder why it's not working. You do have to have that balance that I think sometimes we miss out on. Um, and one of the other things that I, I find um, we can do as corporates is take our recruitment uh, practices take our CSR engagement activities into those communities so that you can actually show the way and actually start changing it, not just in your workplace, but what? Because that's how, then it becomes habit, right? Because sometimes the problem uh, we say is, okay, we're going to do this for this purpose, uh, but not for everything else. And then, then it purely becomes diversity for the sake of diversity. And I think one of the biggest uh, changes we should all advocate to is not to put roles or um, activities based on gender or anything like that because in our cultural norms there is a lot of roles connected with gender versus what I think and I've had these conversations with men when we were talking about policy change in um, um, my company before is we just assume even when we're going we're trying to give these benefits and flexibility that we want to give it to the women only. And the men are putting up their hands and saying, I'd love that flexibility so that I can drop my kids at home, so that I can stay home and look after kids and let my wife be the breadwinner and not be looked upon as a, you know, a weird person. So it starts with a lot of tolerance and a lot of accepting that I feel has to be community related as much as in the corporate. So since all of corporates have that CSR angle also, I think if you can make both of those go together, you're going to make a bigger impact um, that hopefully will actually see the new world that we're all talking about. Um, I'm going to stop there. I know we're running out of time. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, yes. Vani, for that insightful answer. So we are now moving on to our last uh, round of questions. Uh, we are also uh, running out of time, so let's make it quick. Uh, so in this round, we will discuss the role of the employee within the topic of diversity and inclusion. So the first question is, in the light of our discussion, is there a role uh, for employees to play? Uh, Rosanna and uh, Janik, uh, would you like to take this question? Uh, Rosanna, maybe you can go first or yeah. Yeah. OK, um, I think the responsibility uh, for us as people, uh, not as politicians and government is more than the government because what they are not doing for us, we have to do for ourselves. So I think more than anything else, as employees, we should also ask management to teach us how to embrace diversity and, in, and, and include other people, other people who may not be like us but who may also be able to contribute so much. So, you know, this is where our diversity and inclusion programs come, where we do a sensitizing, uh, you know, training uh, for employees as well as upper management to be able so that they can understand what all this is about. You know, they have been taught to hate LGBT persons from a very young age. They've been, you know, basically brainwashed. We all were. I mean, even as LGBT people, we hated ourselves for being LGBT because that's what, you know, everybody around us basically says that we are bad, we are this, we are perverted, whatever. 
So I think sensitizing and education is really key in, in a lot of the issues, even where, you know, uh, disabilities, women, um, you know, uh, ethnic minorities, religious minorities, whatever. I think education and, and, and sensitizing is the key. And as employees, as, as people who are within a company environment, we need to push up our uh, management to make the changes. Right. Uh, well, uh, thanks, Rosanna. Uh, Janita, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, that's the that's the other a part of this equation where the employers, uh, potential recruiters, hire persons with disabilities. When it, in the context of persons with disabilities, so yes, they are in the company. They are placed in a suitable position and everything. But then the retention is completely depending on how the fellow res the fellow employees respond to them. So uh, uh, based on my own personal experience and some of the uh, negative experiences that my friends uh, living with disabilities have shared with me. Uh, what I can say is once you are in the job, once you are in an organization, it's the employees who have a larger tell the new recruit, okay, you are living with a disability, so I, I realize it's difficult for you to work just like we do, so let us do your work. Or sometimes they will say, actually, you know, you don't have to do anything. Uh, and some people are like, uh, I really don't know how to deal with that person. Just like Barney said earlier. Uh, they play it safe, and uh, when it happens, what the person's disability feel is that he is kind of um, stranded in the whole place. So actually, another new employee, you make friends with them, you hang out with them, you realize what they need and you realize where they struggle and you sort of uh, support whenever you need they, they need support so that's pretty much the same thing but uh, being mindful about the fact that they live with the disability and the second one is if you can uh, not if you would not be over Sometimes, you know, some like, um, you know, we have this, uh, we have this uh, staff trip or whatever, but it's a, it's a rafting or hiking or whatever expedition. It does more harm than good because it breaks the spirit of the employee in bonding, in teaming up with the rest of the people, and uh, I mean in trusting them. Uh, so please, uh, if you, in case, have to work with a co-worker living with disability, please uh, don't protect them. So what they need is kind of inclusion, not protection. So that also is something that employees have to keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Janita. So with everything we discussed today, what does inclusion mean to you, uh, Prashant? Thank you. Uh, once again, just want to thank the organizers for putting this together um, and for your company for looking at ways to ensure diversity and inclusion is a reality uh, in your context. So what does inclusion mean to us uh, briefly is I really believe that we haven't 
experience how great we can be. We are far more than what we have become as a nation, as a people. Uh, you know, a lot of my friends abroad, when they talk to Sri Lankans and they say, how can a country with so many intelligent, so many gifted, so many eloquent people uh, still be a developing country? And inclusion means to me that you start living your potential. It starts finally being what you're capable of becoming. And for me, that's that's the joy of it. And to, to no longer have your life being dictated by prejudice, uh, by hate, by uh, ignorance, but ensuring that your life is dictated by the content of the character of a person. And it's not by the whatever else that you want to create, it's by who they are. And really treating people by merit for who they are. And that will you know, unleash the potential of our country. So I hope that it'll unleash your potential as an organization, as a company, that will give you great, it'll be your strongest asset. It will make what makes you stand out from the rest and gives you a great uh, future. So thank you once again for uh, letting us be part Thanks. of this conference. Thank you, uh, uh, Pushan. Uh, Bani, uh, what about you? What does it mean to you? Sure. So I think <laughs> inclusion since is empathy, that we all have a lot more empathy um, and um, mutual respect. Um, empathy is something that you kind of need to train uh, and you need to teach from younger ages. You need to give people exposure. Uh, in order to be able to empathize. So that's something that companies can do. Um, mutual respect, but I do use the word respect a little carefully because when I think of some of the cultures and traditions that we have uh, in our country, I find some of the traditions have become redundant, but we are so busy respecting the old ways that we are not quite questioning. So while we do need to respect each other, we do need to be taught to be able to question respectfully, do things because you understand it, not just because somebody told you or it's just something that was has happened over over time. So I think it's those two simple things that will create the foundation of us uh, appreciating and learning more about everybody else and everything else around us. That curiosity will harness everything that we're saying. Once you do that, I think you become less uncomfortable when you are challenged to think differently or try something different. And that, in my opinion, is where, where growth lies, whether it be people or whether it be communities as a whole. So how do we become uh, more uncomfortable, be, get more comfortable with uncomfortable being uncomfortable, I think is important. And I think a lot of people mentioned this knowledge, awareness and empathy, I think, uh, leads to that and um, it's possible but we do need to hold ourselves accountable and 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 continue it has to be created habits which I think we don't do enough of um, so I, I look forward to uh, hopefully a different world for my son um, starting from what I do at home to what he hears in school to hopefully what he sees in his company being very different or, or better than what we have right now. And thank you for having this. Yeah. Thanks, Bani. And thank you, everyone, uh, for giving us insights into um, issues faced by diverse groups and also advising us on how to support these marginalized groups as individuals and corporates. 